Good morning, Mike. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I have two parts of my business. The first is coaching and training individuals and businesses on how to use Facebook advertising, Google advertising to leverage their business goals. So I also will manage the campaigns for businesses. I've worked with national brands like Rick Stein. Thank you very much, Mike. We have great discussions is because uh, you understand my side of customer service, but I definitely understand your side uh, on marketing. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So uh, for those who don't know me, I'm going to as well briefly introduce myself. I'm Pierre. I'm the founder of Beyond Satisfaction. I'm a customer service consultant and trainer. Uh, what I do is I'm helping business owners and professionals who have the best methods and strategies with their customers so they can get the best out of them, uh, so they can improve uh, and increase their customer satisfaction. Uh, provide a better customer experience, but as well uh, generate more uh, revenue and business opportunities out of their customers to really use customer service, not only as a tool of customer satisfaction, but really as a tool of um, business performance and business growth. Uh, so let me start maybe with the first question for you, Mike. Um, sure. So far away. All right. So the, the topic is about how to build the best customer journey from marketing to customer service methods. So in terms of marketing, why do you believe marketing is so important when it comes to customer experience in order to get on the right foot, I would say? Well, they're both inextricably linked, uh, the customer journey and marketing, because the first contact someone has with a business is probably through marketing. Uh, it's not necessarily word of mouth. It could be seeing an ad in, um, in the newspaper, or it could be an ad online. And the first impression is the start of the customer journey. So we want to make that first impression count. And, you know, you want it to, um, instill confidence in the brand, in the business itself. And that's the, and that's before even a, a sale has occurred, even before the customer is a customer. I think we've discussed before, uh, the customer journey starts before, uh, the customer becomes customer, becomes a pay, paying customer. That's right. I mean, that's one of the things I say when I talk about customer journey, that must be one of the first thing I say that yes, the customer journey starts even before the clients are in touch with you. It starts when clients starts to hear about you. Uh, so you already have a set of expectations in here, uh, that you need to, pardon me, that you need to set correctly. And if you don't set these expectations correctly, uh, then that's how you may either get the wrong clients or either get the, the clients with the wrong expectations. And I think that is, um, as well, one of the, uh, intent of our talk is not only to talk about how to attract clients, but how to attract the good clients. Cause I think mm. all that is that you want to use marketing, not only as an acquisition tool, but in terms of quantity, but as an acquisition tool in terms of uh, quality, I would say. So, you yeah, know, yeah. I definitely, definitely agree with you on that. Yeah, and also customer retention as well, because uh, you can spend a lot of money on marketing, but if you can't hold on to the customer, then that marketing works out quite expensive. But if you can actually, uh, with good customer service and, have, and having a customer journey, you can make that customer a lot more valuable and actually um, be, you know, make your marketing less expensive. That is very true. I think these a little bit like, once you start to have this machine rolling of both acquisition and, and marketing, you can really start to, um, uh, to generate this, um, this acquisition without having actively to look for it because you have a set methods in place that is bringing you, uh, these funnels and this, uh, I'll say rivals of uh, leaves of fresh leaves that you don't, don't constantly have to look for. And I think it's a little bit the same as well with, uh, uh with custom service. Again, once you have the best approach with your clients, you know how to generate customer loyalty and you know how to run your business successfully around your clients. You're actually generating, like you mentioned, more retention, but as well, more acquisition um, with your, through your customers. So uh, it's almost like if customer service and the way you deal with your customers will be one branch of marketing that helps you to get more clients or to keep your clients stronger and therefore bringing you more business, more acquisition, more retention. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah, I think also um, with, with customer the customer journey and we're and with marketing as well. It's seeing uh, the customer not just as a, a blob 
or as a, a mass. Yeah, a customer is an individual. I think that applies to uh, customer service and, mar and marketing and, and yeah. customer journey because it, you know, the, the, the marketing has to be tailored to the individual. Uh, like when you're communicating, uh, really you want to be communicating to an individual, not a mass of people because it has to be, marketing has to be specific. And you have to remember that you're dealing with one person at a time. So yeah. when you're communicating, for example, in a social media post or an ad, uh -huh. you're talking to an individual. Right. Very true. So, um, for example, um, a tool, um, which is very useful to use is something like uh, creating a, an avatar of your ideal client. You know, I say, so you, you get a picture of who you want to communicate to. And that would also give you the, 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 the client that you want. You know, it's true. I mean, the thing is the, sorry. Yeah. You have to kind of know what you want before you get what you want. That's very true. I think is the, is the main principle of customer journey mapping as well is that, um, if you want to build this customer journey successfully through all the specific touch points, uh, either that you have directly as a person with your clients and that all your business is having with your clients without you being involved. You need to know who is your customer persona or the different customer persona you are having. Uh, so you can um, set this journey individually for each types of customers you are having. And I think that's as well as well. That's how as well you, um, you can generate uh, more revenue through your customers or focus on these high value customers is by focusing on them. For example, if you just want to set a customer journey successfully to just provide the best experience, that is really important to do. But if you want to do it so you can increase your retention, increase uh, this, uh, I would say this flow of business coming to you through your current customers, you need to focus on those high value customers that you are having by knowing who they are, why they are high value customers. Is it because they are uh, just more likely uh, to remain loyal? Is it because they have no higher uh, budget? Uh, is it because they are easy, uh, easier to retain, et cetera, et cetera. So that's again, um, customer journey mapping and understanding the avatar of your customers is a great tool, not only to create a great experience for customers, uh, but as well, um, to, um, uh, to make sure that you generate more from your clients. I am just going to check some message and then I believe you have some question. Uh, you have a question for me, Mike. Uh, yes. Let me check if there is any one who asked any questions so far, there is no question, but please feel free to ask me, uh, uh the first, the first question you wanted to ask me. Yeah, sure. I, I, after the question I had, um, was when you do a uh, customer journey mapping, do you actually have a map, a, vi a visual representation of, of that, of that map? I do a visual presentation of that. Yes. But obviously the visual presentation will only be the main touch points. Uh, but next to that, I really do kind of like set research, set documentation based on each touch points, based on each stage of the customer journey. It really varies on how, what is the business, et cetera, et cetera. But I would say that, yes, you will start with that visual and then you will have to go more in depth with specific reports for each either stage of the customer journey or sometimes even for each touch point, most part of the time for both. And I think that's really important to start with the visual and then to go more in depth, depending on what the clients wants to know. And I, I think the main tool as well of customer journey mapping is as well to see what are the pain points, mm -hmm. what yeah. are the things that you do not realize because they are on your customer's end. They, what are the things you want to see from your customer's perspective that you didn't realize until now. So not only the things that are a pain point for you as a business um, owner or as a business or as a service provider. But as a, what are the pain points for your customers that you were not aware of? Because that's as well the main thing about complaints. Is, um, most part of the time you get the complaints and you deal with the complaints once you get it. But the complaints is a result maybe of so many different things. So many little, uh, medium or large pain points that your customers are going through that you definitely want uh, uh, to be aware. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's the key in the customer journey mapping is to start with that visual going depth and really separate pain points to positive touch points and what to do from it, what to change from it, what are the actions moving forward. So I really try to organize it around that, if that makes sense. Yeah, def definitely. Um, 
And that's also in marketing as well, that the you know, understanding the customer pain points. Yep. You know, and that's part of, of uh, working out your customer avatar. You know, what their, what their pain points, what problems do they have, and how can you solve that problem? And also, as you say, you, you need to be able to be solving that problem. Because if you don't, then they're going to wonder why they're with you in the first place. Right. So, so you have to then once, because once you've delivered the product, say, you know, the people think uh, delivering the product is the end of the, of the marketing and the end of the sales process, but actually following up is, is the next step. Very true. Uh, you know, this, and, and I see so many, um, you know, high streets, uh, businesses making that mistake, they deliver the, the product. They never say, oh, how are we getting on with it? Um, you know, you know, here's a discount to buy something else, or do you have a friend who might be interested in buying this product? Uh, yeah. Don't even take your email address or telephone number. So they contact you afterwards. It's so, almost, it's almost like they are being satisfied by the good enough. Yes. Uh, yes. And they take the business they're generating for, for granted. And I think that's the main idea either with marketing or with customer service is that you, if you start taking your clients for granted, if you start taking, start taking the acquisition, you get either through your marketing strategy or through your clients for granted. And I think that's the main vision that you always have when you run a business, you never be satisfied. Uh, always be happy with your business, of course, but always looking for opportunities of improvement, you know? Uh, and I think that's the same is that either marketing or customer services, that if you start to take things for granted, either your customers, either your acquisition or the business you get, or how the business is coming, that's how you start creating threats for your business. Because at some points you're going to deliver the bad experience. You're going to have those negative, uh, those uh, pain points that you don't want to improve. You're going to start uh, not improving, changing what should be changed on your marketing strategy. Or you're not going to go the extra mile. Once you gain the client's mission dot, but there's still a lot to do in terms of customer care, customer experience, and your part, which is the marketing, what you can do to generate a more, uh, more acquisition through uh, the different funnels of clients and leads that you're having. So actually it leads me to the uh, next question. I think we covered it already, but I just would like you maybe to kind of summarize if you have to give one, one to two or three main tips, um, when it comes to a marketing strategy to really start the customer journey in the best manner. Uh, maybe to summarize what's been said, what would be those one to three to two main tips that you will be having? I think one would be to make sure that yeah, your brand is, is clear and that you're consistent. Yeah, so you're not, you know, not got, you know, different names on different platforms, uh, different <laughs> brown colors on different platforms. It sounds quite basic, but, um, I think just the way people think, um, they, they'd like to see some consistency there. So get the, especially if you're selling something which requires the customer to, to think about, about it. It's not an emergency uh, service. Sure, sure. If someone's got a, so if you're a plumber and the customer is knee deep in water, they aren't necessarily going to worry about the brand. The branding, just kind of called the first person who comes up on Google, uh, but if they're looking for a marketing service or they're looking for a, um, home improvement service, uh, you want to really get a good impression straight, you know, straight away, uh, in terms of branding and just, you know, decent looking, uh, images, for example, uh, you know, nothing that's trying not to use stock photos if you can help it. Um. And, you know, just, just have a Facebook page that is well used. There's no tumbleweed on that Facebook page. Your, you know, your website looks good. Um, you're, you're on, on the platform, you know, on the relevant platforms, let's say. Yeah. And I think that everything is aligned as well. Everything is aligned between the different platforms in terms of the branding, the photo, et cetera, et cetera. But as well that all of this is matching with your own values as an individual, with your own business story, with your yes. own reason, I would say why you decided to do that, et cetera, et cetera. So like almost every entity of the business, they all, not almost actually, you can remove the almost every entity of the business 
are aligned with each other. And I think that's, again, how you attract uh, the good clients that you want for your business. And I think that sometimes I can help as much as I want people, uh, businesses and business owners and professionals to manage the customer expectations, to deal with difficult customers, to handle complaints effectively, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes even if you do all this, if the problem is coming from the messaging you put out there, from your branding, your photo, your story, your values, what you post on a daily basis on social media, what you talk about on the YouTube channel, if all these are not aligned, how will you, or it's not clear, or it's not matching with a set business goal, a set way of attracting customers, how will you attract the correct clients? And I think that's yeah. one why so many people say always like when I, I see those conversations where people say that you need, I think the reason why you need to know who your target customers are is not only about what strategy you need to have to focus on those customers, but to make sure that as well, all the messaging, all the branding, the value, the story of your business, et cetera, et cetera, is aligned with the types of target customers that you want to be having. And actually, if you have that, you may already start much better on the right foot by attracting the, the correct uh, clients. I still remember something very simple. Uh, Richard uh, Hyron, if he's watching, I hope he... Oh, the Hyron uh, name, The Hyron Actor. Hello, uh, hello, Richard. If you're there. Well, if he's watching, but uh, maybe he will be watching yeah. a report and he'll be commenting something. Uh, he's, I still remember something that... I don't know if he commented on my post or if I commented on his. But he said something very true. He said, well, actually, that is such a great post. I think that's something I was posting. But he was saying, what is good with my business is that I have less to deal with. So it was a post about complex handling. I think. And he was saying, I have to do much less with those type of situations because I put such clearly my values out there on everything I do that the clients are attra I attract are as in the same values. So again, the target yeah. customer is not only about the industry, uh, the needs, but the issues they're having, the problems you can solve from them, the solutions you can bring, but as well the value that they can have. Because once you have a line value, you're going to decrease quite uh, tremendously the, uh, the, the, the change. The, you're going to decrease, sorry, the, tremendously the amount of difficult clients or complaints you're going to be having because you're going to be dealing with customers that are having the same values that, that you, that are speaking uh, the same language. And I think that is the main link as well between marketing and customer service, if that makes sense. Sorry, I went into a speech, but... Oh, no, that's right. I, I had, a, I had a, a question in term, for you, actually, in terms of with customers, you can have customers who are difficult, yep. but uh, sometimes customers are difficult because they've received bad customer service, and some customers are difficult just because they're, they're just difficult. Yep. Um, so um, how what, do you have like a... An idea, have an idea of who is a, a a difficult customer, or or do you think there's any such thing as a difficult customer? They just have been given bad service. I mean, there is definitely a such thing as difficult customers. Um, difficult clients is something that I, I believe all businesses have to be dealing with. Uh, but now the, the 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 funny thing with difficult customers is, I think the first approach you need to have with difficult clients is to understand the reason why they are difficult. And actually that seems to be such a basic thing, but that not everybody are doing at all. Uh, is that most part of the time, okay, they're difficult. I need to adapt my behavior to my way of handling them to the fact that they are difficult. But once you find out the reason why, either they're not trusting you, they were trusting you enough to go for your services, but they're not mm -hmm. trusting you well enough yet to not be difficult. Maybe they had a previous bad experience either with you or a similar business. Uh, either is a question of trust, uh, either expectation hasn't been managed properly when selling or when doing the marketing part. So they have, they are actually not difficult. They just have the wrong expectations. It can be as well a knowledge barrier is that we find them difficult because they are asking questions on things that are obvious to us, but are not obvious to them. So again, if you do not understand your customer's perspective and understand the level of knowledge they have on the services you're providing to them. How can you service them properly? And how can you make the difference between a difficult client and just a client who wants to understand how it works? And so I think it's really the why behind. Once you kind of focus on targeting the why, I could talk about this for hours, but once you focus on the why, that's how you can handle your customers. The second recommendation I'll be giving for uh, difficult customers is as well to be able to, uh, um, to not only 
try to make things better for the customers, but set your limits as well. Because like you perfectly said, some customers are just difficult because they're difficult. You can try to find out why they're difficult, adapt yourself, or try to, I think, work on the source uh, to make it better. They will still be difficult and challenging. So sometimes you have to set your limits. And that's what managing expectation is about, is setting your limits, saying how things work, protecting yourself by putting things by writing. So then if they come back to you in the future, you can back yourself up. Uh, because sometimes, I mean, I'll be lying if I say customer service is about making all customers happy. No, customer service is all about protecting your business from those threats that customers can be on some instances, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I th is it true, do you think, that also you can turn a, a bad experience around and actually turn it into a positive? Oh, yes. I mean, that is actually, like I always... This is one of the things I always say uh, during my masterclass workshop or my training. Uh, and I always use my experience in luxury hotels uh, uh, to say that actually back in the whole in luxury hotels, my, my most loyal clients um, were previous complainers. And the reason behind that is because actually a complaint, a customer issue, is one of the best opportunities to show care. Mm. Well, it's a little bit like if you're helping your friends going through issues a partner, a family member, you will just generate more trust from that person. Well, it's the same with an issue or a complaint. Is that it's a great way to show how much you care for your clients, the way you handle, the way you show empathy, the way you show patience and flexibility if you have to, and the way you follow up with your customers to make sure it doesn't happen again, but you keep checking on the client satisfaction post-complaint, post-issue. That is actually a great way to generate trust. So it's almost like once you have a complaint, an issue, you have two main ways. Either you make your client, you continue making your clients or you start making even your clients even more unhappy, or either you make your clients even happier than he or she ever was before. Um, yeah. So, so actually it leads me to a, uh, uh, to a question, uh, uh, I have for you. So, um, in order to make the best impact on their clients, uh, should advertisers, marketers, business owners. Um, what should they make it about on their message out there to make sure that it has the best impact on their clients moving forward? So, you know, it's all about the messaging, right? So we talked about the values, but is there any things that you, you would advise marketers, business owners, I'll say that there are mostly people that are doing their own marketing to put out there as a message to make sure that it resonates with their clients even before they get in touch with them? Yeah, I mean, messaging is, is so important and uh, you have to, and that, that's where it comes down to, to a certain degree, um, I say these, creating these customer avatars, because then you can communicate um, the, the right message to that person. Uh, it's understanding your audience as well, like, you know, if you're targeting a certain demographic, then you have to, the message has to be uh, tailored to that for it to, to resonate. Um, to, to be honest, there's also a certain part, a certain, certain element of testing involved, uh, mm -hmm. because the great thing about digital marketing is you can test True. different messages and yeah. Facebook will tell you which, which message is resonating most. So it, it, to some degree, um, the messaging is done for you in the sense that uh, it, like Facebook will tell you what is, what is resonating, what isn't. Mm -hmm. And if people are responding to your the Facebook ads in terms of you know, they're commenting, they're liking, they're clicking on the link to find out more. That's a, that's a good example of your message resonating with the user. No, that is very true. I mean, I really like this idea of putting a message out there that in order to make it resonate, sometimes you need to test it. It's not from the first yeah. time you're going to know if it's the correct one. You need to see the audience reaction. And I think that is such an important part of marketing is to see how your market reacts or you listen to your market. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, doing uh, surveys, for example, can, if you are a, a already have customers uh, that so you can survey, mm -hmm. then you can always find out, you know, why they bought from you. What were their pain points? You know, what, you know, why did they choose you as a, um, 
as a as a vendor, as as a uh, a business. So it's always it comes back to the the customer, and it comes back to the individual at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And just do it. In fact, you know, if you have that, if if you are a business which has been going for quite a while, you and if you're just stepping your or dipping your toe into digital marketing, then if you have a track record of customers, I mean, asking them or analyzing those, you know, the customers you have already is probably one of the best research tools you have. That is so otherwise it's te- is testing things out and seeing what, re- what, what resonates, what doesn't. That is so true. And actually that is a very good point because that is something I love to talk about customer feedback. The, I think the correct feedback approach and I think the correct feedback form. And I think that is a great opportunity to, because many people, they ask it right from the beginning, which is good as well. But again, you, uh, you, I think you'll decrease the likelihood of getting answers. I mean, it depends. There's all feedback strategy that you need to have, depending on how long you get your clients, when you should, you mean you should ask for, for feedback, when should you follow up, how you should ask for feedback, how should be your fault. But that is such a great. Uh, that is such a smart idea to actually, yes, all those feedback forms include some questions about what were the main reasons why you came to me, what were your main pain points, your main challenges, difficulties, problems that make you decided to, what resonated in my messaging that makes you go for me, uh, how did you heard about me, et cetera, et cetera. Those questions, they're so important because you, again, that is a great way by talking to your customers with a set feedback strategy. That is such a great way to have a great feedback from the current market you're working with and to adapt again, that messaging that you put out there. Yeah. So, yeah. So doing surveys and customer feedback is not only good for your re- retaining customers. It's also can be used to get new customers because then you can see, you know, why they're using your service and what, you know, what to use in your own marketing. That is true. And the good thing is that again. It's not only good to attract your customers, which is your part of expertise, but it's as well good to make sure that the experience is better for your customers once you've attracted them more effectively. Because once you ask those, those challenging questions, those answers you may not want to have, but you are the one being proactive in almost encouraging negative answers from your customers by telling them your genuine feedback is important to me to improve and therefore increase the likelihood of them giving you uh, those opportunities of improvement once one, you get them from those happy clients rather than getting it as a complaint. But two, you can then improve moving forward your services to make sure that not only you are putting a better messaging, better marketing strategy out there, but you are aligning your customer experience to that. So you're bringing both up. Mm. So yeah, no, that, that is a, I think that is a very, we could talk about that for hours. So now we'd like to kind of uh, go into more into the Facebook strategy itself. Um, so in terms of marketing strategy through Facebook, what is key in order to have a powerful Facebook strategy, I would say? Well, certainly you need to know, uh, you know, your audience and who you're targeting. You have to have an idea of, of who your ideal customer is, um, as, as previously said, really <laughs> it getting, making sure that, um, you understand that is, is also testing. Um, you always have to be testing whether it's doing A, B tests, um, just seeing what content works, mm-hmm. what doesn't work. Um, is this being consistent as well? Um, so when, I mean, or if you talk about talking about orga- organic, um, Facebook posting and Instagram posting, it's being consistent, uh, not doing it, uh, as, and when you feel like it, it has to be consistent, have a consistent posting schedule and you can use Facebook tools such as Meta Business Suite to do that. Uh, so, and I suppose before that is commitment. We have to be committed to posting uh, regularly as well and being, being consistent. So it's, it's even before, or it's even the prior step is, is commitment to the, to the job. You have to, you have to be committed to Facebook. Yeah. And also with, um, advertising side is commitment to that, uh, with advertising, not uh, set and forget, unfortunately, uh, you have to keep, 
you know, checking how your campaign is doing. You can't just leave it to just run, um, you know, run, uh, like, uh, without any control. You need to, you know, know what your key performance indicators are. That's vital. Um, because some, some stats for Facebook aren't that important. Uh, but some are very important and particularly the stats, which are related to your particular goal for your marketing. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, if your goal is to sell something from an online shop, then yep. obviously sales is going to be one of your key statistics. But if uh, you are looking for leads, then you want leads, you know, uh, statistics, which and uh, key performance indicators, which are related to that. And before then, you also have um, substats that lead up to that too. Like for example, um, if, for example, is if you have an online shop, uh, maybe a substat could be how many people add to cart, for example, um, how many people make it that far. And also you can see, you know, if someone, people add, people add into cart, but they're not purchasing, why is that? Is there a problem with the website or is there a, um, another issue? You know, it could, it could be that you need to have a retargeting campaign. So when someone abandons the cart, you can do a, a Facebook advertising campaign, which then goes and follows that person and reminds them that they've added to cart, but not purchased. Or you can send an email to, to say, oh, by the way, you, you, um, added this to cart, but you know, do you want to continue? And so it's, you do need to be consistent and pers persistent with advertising. It's not, I mean, the biggest mistake I see really is lack of commitment and lack of expectation as well. That is so true. I mean, of, I really like the goals, of, of uh, the marketing goals, because depending on your business, you're not necessarily going to be successful straight away. It does take a bit of testing, uh, and a bit of, um, you know, you have, you have to look at the statistics and see what they're telling you. And uh, if it's not working, uh, don't keep doing it for you know too long. Try something else. I mean, I really like the three things that you, the main three points that you make. The first one, consistency. That is so true. And you know, I used to be maybe not that long ago, to be honest, maybe a year ago, uh, Sometimes a little bit frustrated if I wasn't getting that much likes in a specific post or comments or views. And then of course, well, this begins of opportunities of improvement for everyone in that. But then I was saying something to myself very simple that is related to what you've just perfectly highlighted. It's not about that post. It's not about that post anyway. Even if that post got five likes, uh, two comments and three, 200 views, it's not about that post. It is about the consistency of the post, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn. And it's yes. about again, everything that's been said before, what messaging you put out there, what values you put out there. Um, at the end of the day, you may have a post of 15 likes and three comments, um, or even, even less, you may have a post of five likes and one comment, but if that post resonated at some point with someone that may uh, become one of your clients, it's even better than a post that may have got 40 likes, well, this one as well will, will increase the chances. But again, I think it's, it's really important to, yes, align that consistency with the consistent message, the consistent value that is aligning with your brand itself, your customers and who you want to get. And the second thing that you said that I really like is about knowing what you, for what you're using, you're using it for, um, either it's Facebook or either it's the ads, is what you want to get from it. And that is so true because sometimes we may do uh, and I'm guilty of it. We may do social media as a tick box exercise. And it took me a, such a long time to not make it a tick box exercise. Um, because yeah, otherwise you just do it because others are doing it. You're not doing it with a specific intent. What do I want to get from it? Is it just brand awareness? Is it just generating leads? Is it really closing sales? Once you know, once, and I think, I believe you are 
that's where uh, your expertise really step in when you help your clients is that you will help them depending on what they want to get, but you will as well as well recommend them on recommend them, sorry, on what they should get. For. And I think yeah. that is uh, that is very powerful. And the third point you made is about adjusting, adjusting what needs to be adjusted. I think again, that goes with consistency is that if you want to remain consistent and really make the work that you put in valuable, uh, you need to adjust what needs to be adjusted. It may not be, again, like we said, that you perfectly mentioned, uh, give some uh, tryouts, I'll say. Yes. And another thing uh, that is important as well for for advertising in particular is sure that ev everything's being tracked. So on your website, you have Google Analytics yeah. on there. Because if you don't know uh, what your website stats are, then you're, you're kind of working in the blind. Very true. You don't know, you actually don't know what's working or what isn't working at that point. Um, yeah. so you might stop doing something that actually works. If you don't know your, you know, what, what your, uh, analytics are yeah. and with Facebook, having the Facebook pixel tracking code on your website is vital for your uh, Facebook ad success because then Facebook will know it'll feed back to Facebook on who your ideal customers are. They'll, they can get, they get a lot more information from your website visitors, what they're doing, which, which pages they're visiting, their demographics, et cetera. So it's, it's important to, to track, test, test and track. I think, I think that, that was from like COVID-19. Oh, no, test and trace that, wasn't it? Well, test and trace actually does relate to it's smart. Track is even, be, be, he's even better. So we leave <laughs> behind us yes yes i won't mention many more about that but it's it's, um, it's good to good to test good to yeah. test but then you know uh if something is is working or not and just just, just to see the, the results and with, with a customer as you say it fits into what you say about asking the customer how they're doing because if you don't ask them you don't know if we just Please. ignore ignore them um then you'll never know if they're happy with you or not like he said, um, I think I'm, I'm soon finished with my question. So I, I still have one or two. Do you want to ask me any questions before? I don't want to bombard you with all the questions. Do you have any, uh, any other questions for me? I mean, one of my favorite questions to ask, uh, yourself is how to handle angry customers who are having a, a meltdown. Um, I think, um, certainly we've all had that where you have a customer who is, um, you know, going off on one yep. to, uh, coin a, to coin a phrase. I love, I love this question and I love talking about that. So I'll make it generally about dealing with complaining and then with customers together. Uh, the first thing, the first mistakes that uh, employees, businesses make is that they will try to solve the issue factually for the customer. So they will focus on the factual. But that is wrong, is that even be, even if you actually solve the issue for the customer and you get this factual sorted, the issue is sorted, uh, you find the solutions, that is not the first thing you need to focus on when you're an angry or complaining client. You need to focus on the emotional perception first. And studies say that, study tells us that uh, human reaction is focusing on the emotional first and then factual. So if you focus on the factual first, before acknowledging the emotional perfection, uh, perception, sorry, it is a recipe for failure. So you cannot do that. You need to focus on the emotional. How to focus on the emotional? You need to listen to the customer. Most part of the time when they're angry, frustrated, they want to let it out. Listen and acknowledge. Show active listening through your verbal and non-verbal communication. Paraphrase if you have to paraphrase. Show how much you understand how hard and difficult it is for you. And at that point, it doesn't matter if the customer is right or wrong. Because like I always say, uh, even if the customer is wrong, that is the business responsibility in the customers being wrong. It means that at some point, expectation hasn't been managed properly. Or even worst case scenario, the client should have been, should have been, shouldn't have been on board at the first instance. Should have been said no to right from the beginning because that wasn't the right client with the wrong expectations. Because actually I'm boarding a client with the wrong expectation, uh, just because you want to get that, that additional income um, and you'd be like, okay, I'll give it a try. And the client really wanted to, well, at the end, 
you're not doing a favor to the client. But it's again, as well, starting from that. So it doesn't matter whether the client is right or wrong because the business may have a part of responsibility. And in any case, when you're dealing with a difficult and challenging client, um, sorry, a complaining client and an angry client, at that point, you're not going to have the full, the full picture. So it's not the moment to find out what happened. Right now, what needs to be done is to solve what needs to be solved for the customers. And even if solving for the customers goes to explaining how things work, because maybe, again, maybe you realize that there's nothing you really have done wrong. So maybe you can just spend some time to explain how things work. Uh, but still, you need to, before doing that, focus on the emotional. So listen, show active listening in your verbal and non-verbal communication. Paraphrase, show empathy and apologize. And now, the people may say, well, why would we apologize if we haven't done anything wrong? Because we're just putting the business at risk by saying that we are almost admitting faults when there's not. Well, you can just apologize for the bad experience. That's why I recommend. I'm sorry you went through that bad experience. Because again, you're not putting your business at risk. But again, by doing all this, you are setting your customer, the customers back at your level. Now you can speak to, with the customer. Now you can kind of bring a solution because you're going to have a much less angry, a much easily, an easy client to talk to uh, and to yeah. handle moving forward. So now you can focus on the factual. And I've seen it many, many times. Complaining clients, their issues being resolved, they're still frustrated. They're still unhappy because the, the person handling the, the client, handling the call, didn't show any empathy, didn't show any acknowledgement, didn't make them feel like they understand their perspective, whether they're right or wrong. Because again, once you do that, you'll be even better to, under, to explain how things work, to explain why they, they went through that bad experience and to set your limits again and to manage expectations more effectively. In order to do that, you can only do it if you are focusing on the emotional and you're getting the emotional right. Uh, so yeah, that is the main uh, the recommendation that I will, uh, I will give is that focus on the emotional, then sort out the factual, but you need to start focusing on it. Yes, yes. As a, another question I had was regarding telephone uh, manner and answering telephones. Yeah. There's one thing I come across uh, as a, I suppose, as a uh, consumer and as, as an advertiser is sometimes the um, telephone ask isn't always um, up to scratch, especially if someone is contacting a business for the first time. Yep. Do, uh, do you have any tips on how to? Um, answer the phone to a, uh, to a client or, or potential client. I'll say definitely mind your, mind your verbal and non-verbal communication because telephone is a little bit of a trick one. First of all, you're more likely to face angry and disrespectful clients over the phone because the person is not facing you, but you may therefore get more frustration out of a phone call and you as well, you're not facing the client. So you mm -hmm. may, uh, actually be more likely to express negative emotion and become disrespectful from your head, even without realizing it. So I, I will say right away, again, mind your verbal and non-verbal communication. For instance, there is nothing worse than when you call someone and you explain something, you don't hear nothing for the whole time you're explaining. And there's even a three seconds gap before the person starts speaking. You feel like you're not listened to. But if you're just doing those, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I see, of acknowledgement why the client's explaining something, you are showing, again, active listening, not through your nonverbal communication, your physical communication, but through your uh, way of communicating through the phone, even if the client would not see you. Um, so yeah, that, that is the first, the, the first thing I'll do is that remind the fact that you are more likely to deal with difficult and disrespectful clients and therefore be frustrated, but you are more likely to be like that yourself. So it's really to be mindful of that. And remember that there is some tools of communication you need to use to still show this care, this acknowledgement, even without seeing the customer. For example, right now you're talking to me, I'm talking to you. We will be like nodding with our head to mm. show that. Sorry. On the phone, you don't have that. So how can you transmit that to the phone? Uh, I mean, there's so many other examples that I give. I'll just give one or two more. Uh, another one will be that to re remember that over the phone, you can be actually getting with much more clients than face to face. Uh, sometimes give yourself some breaks. Do not straight away take a phone call. Uh, right after dealing with a difficult client. Um, if you feel you have some, be mindful of what is likely to trigger you in terms of clients inquiry, in terms of types of clients, 
in terms of types of personality, what is likely to type trigger you in trigger you in terms of environment? For instance, sometimes you can be taking phone calls in a very busy environment and be mindful of what expression you are likely to express in that environment. So then again, self-awareness will bring you um, actions, individual, individual actions on yourself so you can control yourself more effectively. But it needs to start uh, with, uh, with self-awareness. And yes, if you have to deal with uh, very angry and disrespectful customers, do not become disrespectful yourself. Stand your ground if you have to. Mainly, do not pay. Do not make the next client pay for that difficult client. And that's yeah, what that is that every time I, I have a rude person over the phone, rude person behind a counter, I know that this person is like that because he or she created a shell for himself or herself to protect himself or herself from other clients that were disrespectful. So now they are like this all the time because they don't want to be disrespected again. And that's where it brings the uh, the personal aspect of customer service. There's a lot of personal in the customer service. When I train people, 60% of the things I talk about, the activities I do, the discussions I have I do is about the, the personal. Because if you don't handle yourself personally successfully and manage your emotions accordingly and be self-aware of all this, you just have those natural protective reaction that's going to make you sound rude where you were not rude uh, at the beginning. Sorry, I went into a speech no, that's fine. Like, like, I guess it also uh, relates to emails as well. Maybe when you get an right. you let yourself cool down first before you uh, respond Definitely. to it. Definitely. Um, I still have uh, one or two questions for you, uh, Mike. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Let me see which one I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose the last one. Um, actually, no, because we're on Facebook, I'm going to choose that one. So now you talk about the overall strategy in. Uh, about about Facebook and advertising on Facebook. When it comes to Facebook ads itself, I know you've already highlighted something, some things. Is there anything specific that you believe is key when it comes to Facebook ads that may uh, stand out from Google ads or other types of ads that you really need to be aware of to get the best out of it? Yeah, I, I suppose, as I said before, the tracking, that's important. Uh, making sure that uh, everything's tracked using the, the Facebook uh, pixel, which is a yep. tracking code that you put on your website. Uh, because if you say, if you're not uh, tracking the results and tracking what your customer or potential customers are doing on the website, then you're working in the blind. Uh, also, also audiences as well, making sure you have the right audience. Um, you can also target uh, people who visited. If you put that, in, well, if you uh, beforehand, uh, had the Facebook tracking code on your website. You can also, uh, you, know, you can um, target people who've, who have visited your website before uh, and you can create a, a lookalike audience based on that, um, based on that, or that uh, audience. Uh, so yeah. Facebook goes and finds similar people to those who have visited your website. And that can be a good source of, uh, of potential, uh, custom also, uh, Facebook can use, uh, your customer list. If you have a customer list of say several thousand people, they can use that list, uh, either to target again through Facebook, or you can target via a lookalike audience. So a lookalike audience of your, of your customers, of your best customers. So, um, so, so yeah, based tracking audience. That's crucial. Um, and copy as well, making sure the copy, uh, resonates, make sure that, um, it, you got call to action with the copy. It's, uh, you know, you want the, someone to do something, whether it's, whether it's to, to like the post it could be as simple as that, or it could be to visit your website, um, leave their email and phone number or go to your website and purchase something. It's like, what do you want the, the, per, the uh, person to do? The thing is, again, is again with what we, you mentioned earlier um, about the fact that in order to have the correct call to action, in order to have the, I think you call it retargeting, right? When you, when you, when you see some type of customers that you already have on your website that you want to, your Facebook ads to, to reach. 
I think it's all about, again, what you want to achieve from it. And I think that's either Google ads or Facebook ads, you know, I believe that's one of the first thing they'll be asking you. Mm -hmm. What do you want to, is it website visits? Yeah. Is it people watching your videos? Is it leads? Is it sales? Is it conversions? What do you want to get? That's right. With, with Google ads and Facebook ads, yeah, you're right. They, they ask you, do you want uh, awareness? Do you want leads? Do you want sales? And they'll tailor your campaign to what you want. So but, actually, it was my, oh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, obviously you have to be realistic as well. Yeah. But the one third of you, it's harder to make a sale when there's no brand awareness and no one's really, you need to enlighten people about your services first mm -hmm. before people will buy something. Uh, so you have to make sure people are enlightened. Uh, so that not, might not necessarily mean a sale of ad. It could be a, well, a lead ad or an awareness ad to start with. So I'm sure that is my, my last question for you. First of all, sorry, just before that, David, David Hatch, uh, that I did as well, a very, very good uh, podcast with, uh, oh, eventually it was a very good session. And he said that he loved the shout out, uh, to the very excellent Richard Hyron, uh, that the we, you see that beauty of, uh, beauty of networking. Thank you, uh, David. And I, uh, I'll take the opportunity to definitely recommend, uh, David Posca podcast, uh, at least as good as Mike's podcast, both of you guys are just doing amazing podcasts and had the opportunity to, to do, to go to the, both of your, uh, both of your podcasts and yeah, it's a very good discussion we had out of it. So actually my last question for you on that, um, would be about, so if you just get started, you are within your first two years of starting your business, that is your first ad, you, this is kind of your first Facebook ads you're doing, uh, and you, you, you do not add, have yet, uh, strong funnels of acquisition that gets you a lot of business uh, to those new business owners that wants to get the best out of Facebook ads. Naturally, they will want to go for conversions and sales, but you said something very, very uh, smart, which is, well, it may not be the best choice. You need to be patient to those people, to those new business owners, what would you recommend them to go for in terms of what they want to achieve? What goal should they set when it comes to Facebook ads? Yes. Well, obviously the, the most important thing is to have a goal in the first place. So once you've got a, a goal set, uh, that's the most important thing. It does, it does depend on the business, of course. I mean, uh, some businesses, it doesn't take much to get someone to uh, buy something, even if you're brand new, if you're a uh, restaurant or a, a cafe owner, uh, it might be as simple uh, as offering a little discount when someone first visits. Uh, you know, it's probably something like that. Um, if it's a business, which is more, maybe, you know, maybe it's more complicated than that, they yeah. need to educate people and help people understand what your business is about. Mm -hmm. So it could be a brand awareness campaign, or it could be visits to your website, just get, getting traffic to a website who you can, then you can retarget them later with more, with more apps. Yep. It's, they, they, it's basically seeing where the customer is on the funnel. So at the, at the top on the sales funnel, they have brand awareness. So they have to become aware of you first. And then in the middle of the funnel, we have lead generation. It's a, sim it's a simplifying it a bit, but in the middle, you've got lead generation. So once they're aware of you, maybe you can ask them for their details so you can send, put them on your mailing list, for example. I think um, that is, that is so good. Yeah. I mean, maybe getting a brand awareness strategy, a brand awareness approach. I mean, as a, as a goal with your ads, focus on brand awareness to get that audience, to analyze that audience, to see who's coming, et cetera, et cetera. Then maybe yeah. you can do a, uh, you can change your ads with that audience that you get to re re retarget, as you said, and go into conversions or sales. So yeah, that's, that is a very good uh, recommendation. Yeah. And then, uh, once someone is more familiar with you, then you can sell to them either online or maybe make an appointment and sell face to face. Uh, what's the market? Cause marketing comes before sales. So marketing is basically make that uh, marketing is getting, making the person aware and understanding what you do, you know, making people want your products and then you have to, to sell the products as well afterwards. So, um, if people understand. 
if you make help people understand what you do first, that's a good first step. I say it depends on the business. Depends how well, there is, there is complex already, it is. That is already very good uh, a recommendation, and I think that is such a great way uh, uh, to finish this explanation. Kind of remind what marketing is about. Is yes, it's not about selling right away. Selling is the second stage that you need yeah. to be doing, or people of your team needs to be doing. The first stage is to put this message out there, to create interest for the correct clients with the correct needs. So they show interest and then you can sell and it's more easy for you to sell, but uh, you may not generate sales right away. You may still have to do this, uh, uh, this efforts. That's why, uh, sales again, needs. that's why you have marketing, you have sales and that's why you have customer service, but again, the three of them, and that's why you have branding as well. All yeah. those different aspects, they are part of the customer journey and they all related to one another. Uh, you cannot be good at one, bad at the three others. You cannot be good at three. But at one of them, uh, because otherwise it will obviously uh, impact uh, your business. Um, uh, Mike, it's been one thing. I, well, one, one more thing I would say is that uh, would be uh, before you uh, run ads, uh, try and post as much as you can organically, because people will then when they see your ad on Facebook, they will check out your Facebook page, and if they see a page which has not much activity. Um, yeah, that's, that's a negative. Sense. You want to build trust as well. People won't trust a, a, won't trust a page, which has very little activity or very little, uh, likes. Yes. So yeah. work on, work on the organic at the same time. Don't just abandon build organic the organic first. Ads. Build the organic first or at the same time and then do the ads. Um, yes. Before. Work. They work best together. Definitely. That is such a great advice. Mike, thank you very much for this. Do you have any, uh, before we wrap up, do you have any other questions for me? Um, I think uh, you've answered all the questions very ably, but, uh, I think one, 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 one question was, um, yeah. how would you, can you have a stat for brand uh, for, um, customer satisfaction? Can you make that into a metric or is it just Yes, there is a lot of metrics, uh, but anything of which one of I'll be, uh, um, I mean, customer satisfaction in itself can increase to up to 60% the total revenue you can make each year because yes. clients are more likely to stay longer, clients are more likely to refer you, clients are more likely to buy more from uh, obviously it's a very so your bottom line is your, is the stat because yeah, it's, it's a very obviously, uh, I'd say it's really varied depending on the nature of the business, the industry, but you can really increase a lot to your revenue. And that's, that's the first thing I like to say about customer service is that customer service is not only there to make your clients happy because making your clients happy doesn't only bring you happy clients. It's a real tool, uh, of, uh, uh, bread, uh, I'll say bread performance, uh, business performance and business growth. Um, another, another, um, Stats I will give. I need to make sure that I remember it properly. Uh, but I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's 70% of happy clients, um, I think even more, 90% of happy clients, it may be between 70 and 90, but I know a huge percentage of happy clients are more likely to recommend your brand to friends, family, et cetera, et cetera. It is always good to remember as well that there is a difference between customer loyalty and customer retention. It's not because you're having one off client for one small offer that you shouldn't give the same care that these big paying clients because that small client, again, all your retained clients have to be loyal, but all your loyal clients are not retained. They may just be loyal because they may always come back to you if they need your help. They may just be loyal because they keep doing amazing referrals or recommending you, et cetera, et cetera. So again, if you only focus on loyalty with your retail clients, that is not the best way because then you're not going to get this, uh, 70 to 90% of referrals from your happy clients. Because again, those ones that are giving you those referrals, they may not be retained. They may just be so loyal, so happy with your brand uh, that they will do the extra mile. And again, providing an offer of quality doesn't suffice. You need to go this extra mile in terms of customer success throughout the whole journey. So they go the extra mile for you. If that makes sense. Yeah, makes total sense.
Perfect, Mike. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Really an amazing conversation.